Hi, I'm Rory. And with me, as always, is Ken. How are you today, Ken? exceptionally well Rory thank you very much for asking I'm uh, grateful to be here and both Rory and myself are grateful that you have joined us for the counseling tutor podcast it is episode 228 three stops on today's journey starting off with those counseling foundations where we visit the foundations that underpin good counseling practice and today a theory we dip our toe into attachment theory nice and interesting then we're going to look at focus on self where we look and recognize that you you are the beating heart of your practice and we need to be okay in order to be there for those that we serve and today we're going to be looking at the four stages of competence it's a little model that you may find interesting within your practice and within your learning journey because we are eternal scholars when we sign up to become counselors mm -hmm. and then our final stop today we go to practice matters it's where we dip our toe into practice anything to do with running a practice presentations we may come across uh, in practice the business of running a practice uh, and today uh, we are uh, very privileged to have essential training associates joining us Rory met up with Rachel and Moira and we're going to be looking at inner child working with the inner child so that's what you can look forward to in episode 228 now attachment theory Rory what is it why is it important well, I think it. I think it's really interesting, and and strangely enough, a lot of these theories, you know, came came about, you know, after the Second World War and attachment theory. How, um, as children, we make bonds to caregivers or to our parents, uh, became prominent after the Second World War with a man called John Bowlby, who um, was asked by the World Health Organization to um, to work with orphans from from the war refugees we may call them now and there's a link to the today isn't there and and how they how they were how you know how they attached to people um emotionally and he developed his theory of attachment theory and i think that anybody who practices counseling should have a working knowledge of attachment because we see it presented so often i think in um the therapy room and the thing about attachment theory it can be a lifelong, mm. um, it can be a lifelong feeling that people have. Some people are well attached, and that they, you know they have what you know a, a ordinary attachment and they're fine. But some people really struggle with attachment, and this can play out into relationships. It can play out into their physical health, uh, and and ultimately it can play out into their destiny. And um, having a having a real handle on attachment, I think, is is essential, Ken. Mm, I agree with you, Rory. And, and uh, attachment theory can be tricky to explain and get your head around. Um, and, and and I guess, Rory, like you say, it's a, it's a lifetime. Um, it's a theory one can visit again and again and again yeah. over the period of a lifetime. You can identify your own attachment style. You can maybe see attachment styles as they present in, in, in clients once you have an understanding. And Rory's prepared a really good uh, handout on this where you can actually look at the attachment styles and identify your own attachment style that you can get from this um, uh, podcast episode so we won't delve too much into what the theory of that is you can go and look that up in the in, in the handout but attachment style is really interesting in that if we go back to the original experimentation that was done and I guess it's behavioral in a way where we mm. look at a behavior but then uh, we look at what coping mechanisms have have uh, maybe come about to cope with that behavior and the original experimentation done with children, as you say, Rory, and looking at the reaction of a child when the primary caregiver, in most cases, the mother, I guess, in, in the experimentation would leave the room when a stranger would come in the room, what would the child do? And looking at the child's reaction to uh, to to the primary caregiver, I guess, retracting or going away. And it's really interesting. I have a, uh, I've got two dogs. One of them is a German shepherd. And my German shepherd has an attachment cable. And that is that my German shepherd will, his name is Boyd, and he'll run off when we go walking, he'll run off ahead of us because he's a guard dog and that's what they do. But he'll only go so far. He'll only go so far, then he stops and he looks and he makes sure that I'm there. And there is an attachment. Mm. There is an attachment. If I'm not there, he wants to know where am I and he's going to come looking for me. And and I 
can kind of gauge how far ahead he will go. He won't just carry on going and going and going. There's almost an invisible cable, Rory, that holds him in place. My dog <laughs> has an attachment. Absolutely. And what you're speaking about, of course, is something called proximity maintenance. That was a, a term coined by, I think, John Bowlby, uh, who said that small children will run. But we see this with our own children, and our, in my case, my grandchildren, where they'll, well, they will run away and they'll get so far. And it's literally, as you say, like an invisible cable. Then they stop and make sure you're there. And, and that is a, a quite a normal and healthy form of attachment. What they're doing and what Boyd's doing is exploring the world, but he's doing it with the safety of knowing you are there. And that would link into what we would call a secure attachment or I'm okay and you're okay position. You know, I'm okay, you're okay. And that's how children grow. And I, I think that it's it's when we we have attachments that are maybe faulty or damaged that, we have trouble forming relationships. And of course, counseling is the therapeutic relationship, isn't it? it? Sometimes plays out. It can play out in distrust. It can play out in, in being fearful. And some clients, um, you know, may even not come to therapy because they have no, you know, no trust at all. And, you know, I, I think it was interesting at the top of the, at the top of the conversation, Ken, you talked about um, the strange situations experiments carried out by Mary Ainsworth. And that's exactly what they did. They, they, they put a child into a room with the parent, brought a stranger in, the parent left, usually the mother at the time, mother left. And then they would observe how the child reacted. And then the, the stranger would leave and the mother would come back. And it's at that point, they could see what kind of relationship the child had with the, with the mother. And, and it, it coined um, at least three types of attachments, secure, Avoidant, dismissive, ambivalent uh, attachment, and and um, you know, in the in the eighties, there was something another form of attachment which you can see in the handout called disorganized attachment, mm. where a child is you know maybe brought up in in very very poor circumstances and has real trouble attaching to anybody. It's a it's a it's a it's a confusion, but I think I think it's pretty essential that people have a rough working knowledge of attachment because it plays out not only in therapy, but in our everyday life, I think. Yeah, we're seeing it within ourselves and how mm. we act, interact with others. Um, and, you know, when you, you'll see more details in, in the handout, so we don't want to go too deep into the theory of it, but we talk, you spoke about secure attachment, Rory, and, mm. and we, uh, over half of the population, about 55% of the population, um, has this secure attachment. And and kind of as, as, as a child, they... Uh, can be separate from the parent. They know it's okay. They can trust others. You know, they've 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 grown up in an environment that has shown them it's okay to trust other other people. They'll go and they'll seek comfort from a parent when they're frightened um, because they okay going to another person and going comfort me. Um, they uh, that they, they would prefer the people they know that are around them more than strangers because I can trust you. You're my parent. And then as they grow up, they become adults and they are more likely with that secure attachment to enjoy trusting long-lasting relationships they don't go in with a position of mistrust but when we start looking at avoidant dismissive attachment this is maybe a child um, who grew up in environment in an environment where they learned that they cannot trust their primary caregiver for whatever reason that may be and their behaviors alter according to that and that is taken into adulthood and you mentioned rory of somebody that may not even come into therapy i can't trust anybody they may say mm -hmm. everybody always lets me down and if they do come into and it's not to say they wouldn't enter therapy with uh, avoidant dismissive attachment many many will but you may see that uh, presenting of everybody always lets me down. It's only a matter of time until people let you down. If you want a job doing, you you, you have to do it yourself. Uh, I have a string of broken relationships because they always let me down. Um, you're only okay when you're on your own. So we can kind of see the, 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 the clues in that and then ambivalent attachment style, which is again, outlined in the, in the handout. And when you identify your own attachment style, it kind of, I guess, illuminates a part of who you are. It's part of that self-development, Rory. It does. I mean, in my training, it was one of the it was one of the kind of highlight moments 
when we were asked to do our own attachment inventory. Mm -hmm. And and it really started a really interesting conversation on two levels. Our, our, our close relationships we have with our friends and, and, you know, our family and that type of thing was one of the conversations. But the tutor quite quickly directed it into, well, how does this, how does this feature in the therapeutic relationship? If you have an avoidant dismissive attachment where you don't trust people, how are you, how are you going to build a therapeutic relationship with your, with your client? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to happen? Now, now thankfully, we didn't have anybody with, um, with the, 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 the uh, attachment style, which was um, disorganized. But, you know, it can be. I mean, you know, people come from very different upbringings. And I, I think it speaks to understanding your own attachment style and working with it. There's some really good news here is, is, is attachment style is, is a brain pathway. Yep. It's, 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 it's hardwired. It's hardwired into our brains. Or it's, it develops into our brains through the years. We can develop a different attachment styles. We can alter the way we attach to people, and you know, with with therapy, and and the, and and the the other aspect of it, and I think this is really important, is that some people may may have a great childhood and then have a really difficult traumatic situation which alters their attachment style. So it doesn't mean that someone whose attachment has has, has been damaged or altered has had a, a very bad childhood. You know, you could have you know victims of, of trauma who then go on not to trust people. So, you know, I think it's one that we should personally consider. And also I think it's one to discuss, you know, in our training groups if we can, and also with our supervisor. If, you know, if we're in practice, maybe you're starting, just starting in practice, and you kind of recognise this, speak to your supervisor about it. It's not personal therapy. What it is, is working out how you form and sustain that therapeutic relationship with the feelings inside you have about others mm. this is certainly a handout you want to hold in your hand you want to print it out and you want to put, put it into your cpd file uh, or your study file uh, it is rory's super duper handout on what is your attachment style and if you want to find out go to counselingtutor.com uh, that is our web uh, that is our website i can't speak <laughs> no, Rory. Um, in the very top menu bar, click on the podcast tab and find your way to episode 228. That's today's podcast. All the show notes from what we speak about is there today, including any links. But there is also the opportunity to download that super duper handout. And that is our counseling foundations. Moving swiftly on to that focus on self, where today we're looking at the four stages of competence, Rory. Yes, and this is something that um, that I think is certainly I've experienced very recently. I recently changed my car, and I went from a manual gearbox to an automatic gearbox. Oh. And um, after years of stick shifting, for our friends in America, you call it stick shift, don't they, in the States, um, I had an automatic. And I didn't get out of the forecourt before I nearly catapulted my wife out of the windscreen because I used my clutch, my left leg, on the brake pedal and hit it so hard. <laughs> the, the, you could hear the seatbelt go clunk. And it took me ages to make my left leg redundant. I only use my right foot. For those who drive automatics, it's, 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 it's the gas and the brake and all the power and the brake. And um, I had to tap my left leg literally every time I got in my, in my car to say redundant, you don't need it. And that is it, it, un unconscious incompetence. My putting my foot, on the break and catapulting my wife nearly through the window was I was, I was unconsciously incompetent. I was still in my mind driving a, uh, you know, a manual gearbox car and we go through these stages of competence. So, you know, you know, taking my car driving experience, then I was consciously incompetent. I had to tap my leg and say, you know, don't use this leg and, and, you know, keep thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, um, I got to kind of conscious competence. I knew I wasn't using my left leg. I was driving the automatic car like it should be. And finally, recently I got in, drove somewhere, and I thought, you know, I've not even thought about my, my left leg. I'm just driving the automatic car as it should be. Now, that's a long story about my driving style. But it, it, it can impact on if we're, you know, if we're changing. And I think one of the things that 
one of the things that I found during this process, it was very, very uncomfortable. I was a competent driver. Yeah, I was completely incompetent in this new vehicle. And I think the same thing can happen if you're maybe you've, you've been a, a practitioner for a long time, you've trained for a long time, you've, you've done the same things for a long time, and all of a sudden you're trying something new. And all of a sudden that unconscious incompetence comes in. You make what sometimes you could say was a mistake. And I think it's really hard to blame yourself and say, oh, I'm hopeless, you know, I'm no good at this. And it might put people off. And I think understanding this four stages of competence is really important. It's a natural progression of learning, Ken. It is. It, it, it's a learning model that we're speaking yeah. about here. And we'll pop a link in the show notes uh, because it, it helps if you can actually see the model. And if you're familiar with Jahari window, yes. it's kind of similar in how it is laid out. So it is a box that is divided into four. Um, and in the top left-hand corner, we start, we start there with unconscious incompetence. And this is not being conscious that we are incompetent in an area. Now, I'm going to give you an example in a moment using using juggling, um, so learning how to juggle in just a moment. But you move from this unconscious incompetence, not knowing consciously that we are incompetent in a certain area, to conscious incompetence. And believe me, if you've watched a juggler and then picked up some uh, juggling balls, you go from unconscious incompetence of looking at the juggler and going, yeah, that's okay, I guess, um, to picking up three balls, trying it yourself, and you get to conscious incompetence where you go, okay, I can't do this. I am completely incompetent. I cannot do it. It's not easy. And you would practice. And then you would go to unconscious, uh, sorry, you would then go to conscious uh, uh, competence where when you're thinking about it, you can be competent. I've got to really concentrate to juggle and then I can be competent. And then the final stage uh, of the of the four boxes is unconscious competence. It's where you can think about something else and you're actually unaware of what you're doing because you are uncompetent. You're not consciously focusing on it, yet you are able to be competent within that area. So starting with that unconscious incompetence is when we don't know. It's kind of out of awareness if we look at it's unknown to ourselves, unknown to others, if, we, if we're kind of comparing it to Jahari's window. Yeah. We, we don't know it's there. We don't know it's there. And actually, it's something that comes up in our Facebook group quite often because yep. people will say, oh, I'm, I'm just trying this new skill and I, I, just, I just don't get it. It's really complicated. And you might be finding that in your training. You might be finding a, a new a new skill or you, a new intervention or even a new aspect of personal development. And you, you feel you, you guessed it wrong. And it can be quite off-putting. And um, I think it's a case of persevering because as you move through that model, you, you you gain mastery of something. And I, I think I, I read somewhere that you only really master any, any kind of activity once you've done it a thousand times. And if you want to join our Facebook group, seeing I've mentioned it, Ken, if you go to, uh, counsel, if you type in Counselling Tutor into Facebook, you'll find us. We're a closed group, but knock on the door and our friendly, caring moderation team will let you in. And you can join thousands of like-minded people who are talking about the world of counselling and psychotherapy. We have students, qualified colleagues we have some tutors and we have some supervisors and and they all engage in a wonderful rich debate about the tapestry of counseling and psychotherapy but yeah i think it's i think getting back to stages of competence it's something i think everybody goes through and i think it's reassuring to know that it is a natural progression of learning it's not a reflection of who you are and well, i'm not getting it right it's just a natural progression of learning isn't it ken it is and and <clears throat> You know, it's like you, you mentioned that you might come across this if you if you maybe do some CPD or if you do some some focused specialized training. Um, we um, we we have supervision training through counselling tutor. Now, the unconscious incompetence part of that might be, oh, I want to be a supervisor. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. You know, I've been in practice for five years. Um, I love practice. I want to be there in the service of others. Mm -hmm. Now they're is an incom uh, there is an unconscious incompetence and we know this because we we hear it from the 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 people that choose to do our training they get on the training and they go whoa okay hold on there's a bit more to this than i initially and an anticipated this is this is tricky there are challenges here for me now we've got conscious incompetence so it's gone from oh that's something i'd like to do to hold on a second 
this is trickier than I thought. And of course, all the way through to that uh, un unconscious competence at the end of the training where you're out there supervising and it just flows and it, it, it kind of happens. And we saw this as well. And maybe you can relate to this if you've done any online work. When the pandemic hit, many people needed to move online. Now, before, if you thought about online, you say, yeah, okay, online is there, but there is an unconscious incompetence in that area. Get online and start trying to offer therapy, and you then go, okay, this is tricky. I've got to think about how I look. I've got to think about the sound. I've got to think about the internet connection. I've got to think about the, the, the client and their ability to be able to connect with me. Now it's getting difficult, and you get that conscious incompetence. There's something I have to learn here. You go through the process of consciously learning that to the point where, I know with you and I, Rory, we work online all the time. We don't even think about it. We just jump online and do it now. Yep. And that's that, in, that, that is that unconscious competence. So there it is. There, there are the four stages of competence. Uh, and, of course, uh, there's a link to that in the, in the show notes. If you want to check that out, you are going through it. We go through it all the time. And our clients go through it. You know, the, my client may come in and say, I've been given something new at work. And I feel so stupid because mm -hmm. I just can't get it right. And I keep on making mistakes. And we can maybe share this model as, as, as part of normalizing if it is applicable in your uh, relationship with your client and your modality. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. And I think it comes under the broader heading of being kind to self. Ah. Because, um, you know, sometimes it can be very frustrating when you're doing things and you're thinking, why, you know, why well, I should be able to do this? Is this something, is this something not right with me? <laughs> I'm not wired up properly. And and the answer is probably on some level, you're not, because you've got to you've got to replicate something before it becomes um, you know, a habit and a and, and a behavior and something that you can do. But it is a natural process. And I, I and I'll pick up on the supervision aspect. I think that one of the the beauties of watching um, you know, trainee supervisors develop their professional formation in supervision is the fact that the tutors are really supportive and they really do support the fact that, okay, well, you know, you know, maybe, maybe that, that hasn't gone, you know, quite as you thought, but, you know, have a think about, you know, what else you could have done and, and reflect on it. And I think training in competence is about reflection. It's yeah. about going back and thinking, what, you know, if I did that, if I just did that slightly differently, what would what would happen? It's not about beating yourself up. Being kind, I think, is the essential in the journey of self development. Here, here, Rory, and and that's why this sits under focus on self, because we can beat ourselves up. You know, why can't I get it right? Oh, I'm not very good with technology. I'm not very good with the internet. I'm not very good with the computer. We're kind of beating ourselves up for yeah. conscious incompetence. There is no natural wake up one morning and now you can do things. We have to go through a learning process. We have to go through that conscious incompetence to get there, you know, uh, to, to be able to reach the conscious competence. And then, of course, the, 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 uh, the unconscious competence. It's an interesting model. And mm -hmm. it is there, uh, I guess, uh, for you to have a look at if you if you want to delve a little bit deeper counselingtutor.com if you're interested in our supervision training you'll find information there as well but if you just want to look at the notes from today counselingtutor.com click on the podcast tab episode 228 you'll be able to get the super duper handout there and a link to the four stages of competence so Focus on self. We now focus on practice as we go into practice matters. And uh, Rory, today, I think this is really interesting. You know, in practice matters, you always bring us a, uh, a variety of things that we can mm. look at. And today, something that I think is applicable to all counsellors. So we, we're talking about inner child work. But when, we, when we're talking about working with the inner child, we're not necessarily talking about working with young people because the inner child certainly lives within me rory it it lives within me as well <laughs> uh, i could i could i could tell you that <laughs> and anybody who's seen me with my grandchildren will see that there's three ch small children in the room not one adult <laughs> well, um, yeah, essential <laughs> training associates rachel and moira rory met up with them to have this a chat to bring this information to you absolutely and also my uh, rachel has has recorded a fantastic lecture for our counselor cpd library on uh, inner child work we're fortunate to have uh, both rachel and moira on the podcast they're both experts in, in in child therapy and child training and this is what they had to say about the inner child and we welcome rachel eastrop and 
Moira Hood from Essential Training Associates. They're experts in the training of child therapists. And we're talking about a lecture that Rachel recorded for the Counselor CPD Library called Working with the Inner Child. So first of all, Moira and Rachel, you're very, very welcome. Hi, Rory. So I'd like to start with you, Rachel. When we're talking about the inner child, what are we actually talking about? What is the inner child? The inner child represents um, really our early childhood experiences. And for those of us to whom we've not integrated what happened in our childhood, then that part of it still, if you like, resonates in our adult life. And it's, you know, the inner child has a voice and has emotions and has memories. And these experiences, usually traumatic, usually taking place in early childhood, rise to the surface, if you like, um, in our adult life and break through at times of stress and anxiety. Uh, and they can, they can come out, I said in my talk, they sort of appear at um, unexpected and inappropriate times sometimes. And they, they represent a part of us that needs to be heard and issues that need to be resolved. So Moira, just picking up on Rachel's observations about the, the, the inner child appearing in the adult, how might that appear in the therapy room or indeed in the client's life? Hi, Rory. Um, it would appear in the client's life with um, things like anger, rejection, um, having lost in negative feelings, um, displaying um, inappropriate behaviours, uh, violent acting out. Uh, these are all some of the um, issues that can be around for someone who has had an early life trauma and hasn't had that opportunity to heal those early hurts and that that sits within the adult um, as the damaged inner child so so Moira we sometimes hear we sometimes hear the 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 term the child is very much in the room would that be an accurate description of an of an adult displaying those behaviors yes Rory um, I've seen it in workplaces I've seen it in the therapy room often in the therapy room the way that I work is most of my work takes the adult back to their early childhood and we look for where did the trauma first begin, what needs to happen. Um, a lot of the work that I do is in sand play therapy and we do a lot of inner child work within the sand tree, in our sand play when we're working with clients. And the way that the, the client works in the sand is going right back to those very early days and the trauma is healed and the process happens um, and the the adult can then become into themselves. I mean, I think that's, really, that's a really useful kind of overview of, of how we would work within a child. I'm, I'm also interested, um, Rachel, in, in what's sometimes called respectful reparenting or the repatriative style of the therapist. Do we, do we, do we sometimes find ourselves when we're working with that inner child of being that respectful parents. I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the work of Patricia Clarkson and the repatriative style, the, the fact that you're mirroring the, the early parenting that the child may not have, not have had. Yeah, absolutely. Moira and I talk about this a lot. Our work is always through the lens of the attachment theory. And so we, we, we call it standing in that kind of maternal or paternal gap. Um, and within the therapy room, it's not being frightened of that, if like maternal transference that can go on between a client and the therapist, particularly when you're addressing and you know you're addressing their mm -hmm. inner child, because that child has missed out on these important experiences of being, you know, heard and having kindness and uh, all that kind of a, appropriate loving behavior. So absolutely, that's a really vital part of the work. But also, um, part of the work of the, the inner child is helping the adult client to mm. also parent the inner child because they're there 24 hours a day the therapist can't be so you know it's 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 not to replace because the, 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 the therapy must end at some point so part of the therapy work is helping um, the adult show that child the compassion that they need on a daily basis sure so so 
I, I think I'd like to pick up with that, Maury. You, you were you were nodding furiously across the studio screen when you were, talk, <laughs> were talking about, you know, uh, h- helping the client regain themselves. What kind of things would a therapist do to help them harness, if you like, their adult place? Within the therapy room, yes. we do a lot of reflective work. Um, we can do two chair work where the, the adult has the opportunity to go back and talk to the, the parent um, and talk from their perspective, from that inner heart child perspective. Uh, there's a um, mirroring, there's the way that we manage ourselves within the therapeutic space because there's the holding and the containing of that damaged child whilst you're still working with your adult. And to be able to support the adult to go back and do that early work um, helps them then to move forward. If they've missed out on those vital stages, it's it's difficult for people and adults to go on and have a satisfactory life without going back and doing that early life work that's that's fundamental to people's well-being. Yeah, so I mean, I I, I mean, I think you've made an absolutely excellent point there, Moira, because. You know, one of the things that that we can observe as therapists is that people go through a a, a span of development and and if they miss any part of that early development, then it becomes it becomes a with the best will in the world a deficit, something that they get yeah. stuck. So yeah, yeah. Wor- working with that stuckness is that is that something that you would do, Rachel? Would you would you kind of point out if someone was regressing into a child state? Mm, absolutely. And, and you know, I say this in my talk, it's, it's really important for therapists to listen out for the signs and the cues. Um, mm-hmm. That sort of younger language, the, the, the juvenile way of describing things like it's not fair and, you know, uh, these kinds of things. Um, it, ne- nothing ever goes right for me. All of these kinds of, if you like, um, catastrophizing and global language that children often use when they they feel aggrieved or they feel that something um, has happened to them that's unfair. So when you start to hear that within the, the, the counselling room, it's it's really good to start to use. And, and Moira and I are big with our creative work. Moira's excellent with sand tray. She um, uses that predominantly in her work. I use it also as part of my work. And it might be a suggestion that we put in. It all depends on whether that you know inner child work is what you're focusing on. But if you're hearing that, to then begin to use things like the Russian dolls or like small world characters, just to help uh, the client to represent or to find a character that might represent that inner child, to start to give them their place. Because so much of what we do is avoid or dismiss that the inner child that's there and, and, and push them away and quieten them down and not give them the voice that they need. They're crying out to be heard, you know? I think I'd like to pick up pick up on that, you know, the, the voice that they need somewhere. I'm, I'm, you know, from my experience of working within a child, there's a child's voice that hasn't been heard. And mm-hmm. Moira, it, it, how important is it for that child's voice to present itself in the room and be heard and be acknowledged? It's it's so important for people's mental well being Rory for that that inner child because if the inner child is not heard and if it's rejected by the therapist uh, the the healing can't happen Um, I notice that when my clients are talking about workplace situations friendship issues you know and then we look back then to what what happened in your earlier days are there times when you felt like this before and we, we go back so that we can move forward Oh, I like that. I like that. Mm. <clears throat> you've got to go backwards. You go, almost you have to. You have to sort of rewind, go back in time, yeah. meet the meet yeah. the meet the child where they meet the the child in the in the adult where they are. Meet them where they yeah. are, and then yeah. walk them forward into their adult. Would that be a, a, a good s- summary, Moira? Uh, absolutely. And you know, you know, Rachel and I, um, a lot of our focus is on working with children and young people, and um the idea is that if we can help the child heal, they don't take that into their adult life. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the earlier we can work with children and the healing can take place, um, they can move forward in a way that they're developmentally meant to move forward. Well, I mean, I think that is such an important point to take away. You know, that's a, that's a great takeaway, isn't it? That, you know, people have to move through that developmental milestone emotionally to be able to move towards a more regulated adult so so finally Rachel 
This is, I've seen the lecture, it's, it's an absolutely brilliant lecture. What do you hope that those who are watching the lecture will take away from it? What I hope that they take away, most importantly, is that they attend to their own inner child. This, you know, as therapists, we hold such an immense responsibility towards our clients, but we also hold an immense responsibility towards ourselves and our own well-being. And I know, I know the voice of my own inner child, and she um, will be heard sometimes, and she needs to be heard, and she is activated by some of the clients that I see, and I have to attend to her, and I give her her time, not in the room after, but I, so th this is the one thing, the one big takeaway I've got is please, if you've never uh, if you've had um, childhood trauma and you are a counsellor and you have not worked on that childhood trauma yourself, please do that. Please look at your own inner child and hear them out before you can start to hear your clients. And uh, that's one of the big things that I want people to take away. Well, I, I think on, on those very wise and profound words, I will say, Rachel Eastrop and Moira Hood from Essential Training Associates, thank you so much for joining us. A big thank you to Rachel and Moira. I've met both and just such lovely people, so willing to share, share that value system of really making a difference by sharing what they are experts in. And that was incredibly well done, Rory. Thank you for hosting uh, that uh that podcast and of course as as Rory said running into this you know if this interests you inner child work interests you uh Rachel has done an entire lecture uh, on on this topic and that can be found in the counselor CPD library if you remember log in and you can access that lecture uh, if you're not a member of the counselor CPD library go to counselingtutor.com because all the information of how to join is there and it will cost less for a year's membership. It will cost you less than the price of a cup of coffee with a friend once a month. Really will. So go and check that out. That's uh, counselingtutor.com. And this has been episode 228, Rory, of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Yes, we start off with Counselling Foundations where Ken and myself talked about attachment theory really important to know our own attachment style and to think about how that impacts you know in our relationships both personally and within the therapy room then we moved on to the four stages of competence um, how we learn to master or, or, or to control something that we're doing and not to be too hard on ourselves to be kind and then finally practice matters a fantastic interview with Rachel Eastop and Moira Hood talking about inner child work and as always stay grounded and stay safe